Mischief and Mayhem, a Pride and Prejudice novella, written by Christy Capps, narrated by Stevie Zimmerman. 1. Mrs. Francine Bennett was either the most foolish of women or the most cunning. Fitzwilliam Darcy, master of Pemberley in Derbyshire, had long prided himself on being a better-than-average student of character. Despite his long track record of accuracy, this woman puzzled him exceedingly. What sort of mother would bring three daughters and a baby to determine the health of her eldest, Miss Jane Bennett? What rendered the situation even more confusing was Mrs. Bennet's knowing the competence of her second child, who had been on hand since the day prior, when the family had been informed of Miss Bennet's illness. Miss Elizabeth had well demonstrated her devotion to her sibling by walking the three miles from her home at Longbourn to Netherfield Park, where her sister had sneezed throughout the night. Upon arrival, rather than attempting to seek his or their host's attention, as most unattached females were wont to do, Miss Elizabeth had asked after her sister then spent the remainder of the day shut up in the sick room. Yet there Mrs. Bennet sat, fussing over her youngest daughters and the sleeping babe in her arms. In a move similar to the society matrons of London, whose most desirable goal was to attach their unwed daughters to wealthy gentlemen, the woman sought to ingratiate her eldest into the heart of his host. "'Mr. Bingley, I cannot imagine Jane being able to return to Longbourn before the week is out.' Mrs. Bennet sniffed inelegantly. "'Why, my Jane is never ill. All in our household are brimming with life and vitality. Since her birth, Jane has been the most pleasant of all of my children.' Miss Lydia Bennet, daughter number five, loudly blurted, "Mamma, you said I was the most pleasant. I know you did. Why, only yesterday you told Mrs. Goulding how happy you were to have me as your youngest girl, for you saved the best for last.' I heard you as clear as day, Mamma. So you see, Jane cannot be the most pleasant. Miss Kitty Bennet, daughter number four, nodded her agreement. You did say that, Mamma. I am sure you did, for I heard it myself. All of God's children are sinners, so none have reason to boast. Miss Mary, the third Bennet daughter, plopped her pious opinion right into the middle of the conversation, with not one of her relatives giving her viewpoint any heed. Girls, Mrs. Bennet reprimanded, that will be enough. You will wake Thomas. Lydia whined, All you ever speak about is Tommy, Mamma. I was the most important until he came along. Lydia Bennet, you hush now. Mrs. Bennet covered the babe's ears in a vain attempt to protect him from his noisy sisters. His name is Thomas, like his father. Tommy, Thomas, what does it matter? How was I to know you would have a baby after so many years of trying? A woman of your age? Why, it is shameful if you ask me, Lydia whispered, loud enough that a deaf person in the next shire could have heard. Mrs. Bennet hugged the baby tighter to herself, then hissed, Quiet! Your brother's birth has broken the entail against our home, which means we will not be thrown to the hedgerows when your father dies. Now hush, or you will wake Thomas. It was too late. With a whimper and a wail, the lad flung his arms wide. Instantly, his eyes popped open. Surveying the room, the babe struggled to sit up. Completely uncaring of who had roused him from slumber, he quieted as soon as he noticed his surroundings. He was no longer at Longbourn. Darcy followed the babe's gaze as it travelled from one end of the drawing room to the other. Bright blue eyes ignored the pretentious opulence preferred by Netherfield's hostess, Miss Caroline Bingley. Instead, it was the bare rug on the floor in front of the fireplace that first held the youngster's interest. Then the mirror above the mantel caught his eye. The rustling of silk next became his object of study, as Miss Bingley stood to call for fresh tea. The boy's eyes quickly passed her by to pause at Mr Charles Bingley. Darcy used the opportunity to attempt to guess what the baby saw. A well-dressed slender man, with a large smile showing big white teeth, aligned neatly in a row. Yes, the babe would no doubt find his host to be an amiable man, as most did. It was then that the little fellow's gaze landed upon Darcy. As the babe examined him, Darcy did the same to the boy. He was a handsome lad, probably no more than a year in age. 
rather than cry like the few babies Darcy had been around. The boy grunted his displeasure at having his nap time interrupted, his tiny nose wrinkling as if the smells surrounding him were bad. Unexpectedly, the longer the child studied Darcy, the more unsettled the man felt. His collar suddenly tightened against his throat. His palms began to sweat. He gulped. He knew those eyes. Although they were identical in colour to his eldest sister's, the shape, sparkle and piercing quality belonged to Miss Elizabeth. That lady's dark brown eyes were mirrors to her soul. Several times in their brief acquaintance, he had seen firsthand both joy and ire filling her orbs. Most often with him it was ire. Yes, the boy had the penetrating, knowing stare belonging to Bennett's sister number two. Darcy blinked twice, hoping the lad would do the same. The babe stubbornly refused to budge away from his perusal. Good heavens! How was it possible that a child of only a dozen months or so could have flummoxed him to the point of discomfort? Darcy wanted to snort. He was the one whose stare intimidated others. Yet this child... Darcy's conjecture ground to a halt. It was not the lad who discomposed him, indeed not. It was the sister with the same eyes, the same attitude of having no fear despite provocation. He was grateful Miss Elizabeth was not present in the room. Darcy had no clue how he would respond with two sets of eyes studying him like a trapped specimen under a microscope. All three of the youngest Bennet daughters offered to comfort the lad. Instead, the mother bounced him on her knee, apparently adding to young Bennet's irritation. Without taking his eyes off Darcy, he grunted even louder. With each complaint, Darcy's blood pressure jumped up a notch. The inclination to leap to his feet and rush from the room almost overwhelmed him. At that point, apparently having been judged as worthy, the babe became silent, wiggled and squirmed until his mother set him on the floor, then set off with unsteady strides directly towards him. Should he run? Should he hide? Ridiculous. He was a grown man of almost twenty-eight years, well over six feet tall, with muscles formed from hours spent in the saddle caring for the needs of his estate. He was not a master who was afraid to get his hands dirty. Additionally, Darcy had been twelve years old when his sister was born, old enough to hold her regularly until he left for Eton the following year. By the time he returned from university, Georgiana was old enough to insist on having her own feet kept on the ground. Needless to say, he did have some experience with children, although it had been years in the past. This little fellow was no threat. How difficult could it be to direct the child away from him anyway? Sitting back in his chair, Darcy uncrossed his legs, placing both feet on the floor. Rubbing his palms down the fabric of his trousers, he casually rested his forearms on the sides of his chair as he waited to see what the youngster would do. Oh no, oh no, oh no. The toddler rushed towards him, approaching with more speed than finesse. Once he reached the small table to the side of Darcy, the lad pushed against the edge to steady himself. The cup and saucer filled with freshly poured tea toppled along with the furnishing. Darcy leapt to his feet and grabbed the baby to keep him from getting scolded. Pulling young Bennet into his arms, Darcy held him close, checking to see which way the liquid flew, and then stepping away from the fray. Mrs. Bennet screamed at the danger her only son and heir faced, then fainted dead away. The three Bennet girls fussed and fretted, causing an unholy cacophony to reverberate around the room. Miss Bingley yelled at the baby to stop his destruction, while her brother rang for a maid to clean up the mess. Unfazed, the Bennet son looked directly at his rescuer, cooed his pleasure and smiled. Six pearly teeth were revealed, as the silly child ignored the turmoil around him, in favour of grinning at the man holding him. Without thought, Darcy began swaying gently back and forth, a move he had not used since his sister had been an infant. When the baby tucked his forehead into the side of Darcy's neck, unknown emotions surged through his chest. The boy sighed deeply, poked his thumb into his mouth, and closed his eyes. Within a heartbeat, the frigid outer edges of Darcy's heart melted into a puddle at his feet. Two. Elizabeth Bennet entered the drawing room with no expectation of disaster. A brief message had been delivered by a maid, 
informing her of her mother's arrival. Jane was resting, so the timing was perfect. What greeted her when she stepped inside the doorway was far from ideal. A single glance revealed Mary, Kitty and Lydia fussing over her mother. Mr and Mrs Hurst, their host's sister and brother-in-law, were seated quietly at the far end of the room. Mr Hurst was sound asleep on the sofa, and Mrs Hurst played with the bangle bracelets on her wrists. There was no threat there. Mr Bingley was pacing in front of the fireplace, expressing his concern over the state of Elizabeth's mother, while his youngest sister was attempting to draw Mr Darcy's attention away from the... baby? What was this? Mr Darcy was slowly rocking, a contented toddler in his embrace. Tommy, how could this be? Quickly approaching the pair, Elizabeth held out her hands to remove her brother from the monster's arms. Having her sweet, innocent sibling being held by that man was like voluntarily turning an infant over to the care of a rabid dog. To her surprise, Mr Darcy kept firm hold of little Thomas Bennet. Sir, I will see to my brother now, if you would release him to me. Elizabeth stood her ground. I believe he is perfectly comfortable where he is. Of all the pompous, supercilious... Elizabeth fumed. She well knew the sort of man he was. Not two weeks prior, he had publicly condemned her as tolerable, not handsome enough to tempt him, and a punishment to have her or any other lady in the room as a dance partner. He might look the part of a fine gentleman, but a gentleman he was not. Miss Bingley decided to join the discussion. Yes, Mr Darcy, you should give him back to his family. Babies, as I understand, are notorious for causing trouble. Already the infant has possibly damaged the wood on the side table. He managed to break one of my mother's teacups at the same time. I would hate to see drool on the fine fabric of your jacket, or dirty fingerprints on your pristine cravat, if it could at all be avoided. What? Mr Darcy looked as stunned as Elizabeth felt. Dirty fingerprints? Tommy? Elizabeth restrained herself from delivering a scathing reply. Miss Caroline Bingley's ignorance of Tommy's character helped settle the anger simmering inside her. As the youngest of the Bingley siblings, what did Caroline know of babies? Ignoring the provocation, Elizabeth said, I can see there was a measure of turmoil in the room. From experience, I imagine Tommy was at its centre. Therefore pray hand him over, so I can tend to the needs of all of my family. Your brother is fine where he is, Miss Elizabeth. Darcy nodded towards the nearest sofa, as he too gave no regard to Miss Bingley. It appears the ladies of your house need your attention instead. Had he sneered? Was he mocking her? The man was infuriating. Dropping her hands to her sides, Elizabeth easily located her mother's reticule, which contained her oft-used smelling salts. Within seconds, her mother regained her consciousness, but not her sense. In opposition to Elizabeth's most immediate desire, Francine Bennett's eyebrows lifted almost to her hairline as she praised Mr Darcy for protecting her son. "'My dear, dear man!' Mrs Bennett proclaimed. "'Dear man!' Elizabeth wanted a gag. "'You single-handedly rescued my son. I will be forever grateful.' Mrs Bennet stood to walk towards the object of her attention. "'Mr Darcy, I told Mr Bennet after the Meryton Assembly that you were a disagreeable, horrid man, not at all worth pleasing, and that you were so high and conceited that there would be no enduring you. But I was wrong. You cannot be the man I thought you to be at all.' Elizabeth groaned, wishing the floor would open up and swallow her from her misery. Could her mother possibly embarrass her more? Even Kitty and Lydia, who rarely caught the tone of a conversation not involving them, were stunned into silence. Glancing at the man her mother had abused and praised by ill-chosen words, Elizabeth watched as a deep red colour rose from the top edge of his cravat to his cheekbones. Was he humiliated or angry? Elizabeth hardly knew. What she did know was that her brother was not safe in his arms. As Mr Darcy kept his opinions to himself, Elizabeth's mother proceeded to heap praise upon praise on the man. Mr Darcy, I cannot begin to tell you how appealing it is to see a gentleman with a babe resting in his arms. Why, it brings delight to this mother's heart, I tell you. 
for every mother would not fail to picture you, as tall and handsome as you are, with their daughter at your side and your own infant in your embrace. What a pleasing image you create, sir. The scarlet covering the man's face transformed to a deep purple hue. Tommy reacted to his mother's voice by waking. Drawing away from Mr Darcy's chest, his eyes glanced around the room, landing on Elizabeth. Issy! Tommy's little arms reached out as he leaned towards her. Issy! Relief flooded her. Approaching the two, Elizabeth placed her hands under the boy's arms, lifting him away from potential harm. Her mother may have praised the man, but Elizabeth knew who and what he was. Mr Darcy, I will take him now. She left no room for argument, as she rested her brother on her hip with one hand, while she used the other to steer his fingers away from his fascination with her garnet rose necklace. Da, Tommy said. Da. Elizabeth looked down to see him staring at the man, a grin on his face. Da, Mr Darcy, good heavens, that will never do. Mrs Bennet's words hit Darcy like a blow straight to his gut from Gentleman Jackson himself. Disagreeable, horrid, high, conceited. Him, impossible. What a nonsensical female. Darcy scoffed to himself, refusing to display any outer reaction to the painful insults. What made the comments even more unbearable were that they were heard by others whose opinions did matter to him, Bingley and Miss Elizabeth. Good Lord! Did the daughter feel the same as the mother about him? Surely not. Or did she? Boldly, Darcy attempted to catch Miss Elizabeth's eye, to no success. He recalled being disagreeable the evening they met. Bingley had pressured him to attend an assembly, where Darcy knew none other than their immediate party. He was familiar enough with himself to comprehend he was not at his best amongst strangers. According to Mrs. Bennet, Darcy had not composed himself well. Drat! What was he to do now? Apologise to the masses in the room. Would the humiliation of admitting his faults in front of the Hursts, the Bingleys, the Bennets, and the servants cleaning young Thomas's mess serve to elevate him in the opinions of others? He was no good at this. During all his conjecturing, Miss Elizabeth paid him no heed. Instead, her attention was fully on her brother. Until Darcy could come to terms with this new information, he would focus on the one subject universally approved by all, the baby. It is my hope that you find the young lad unharmed from his adventure. He addressed the room, but did not remove his eyes from the lady holding the child. He is a fine boy, Mrs. Bennet. I can only imagine the joy his birth brought to your whole family. Mr. Bennet in particular must be grateful for a son. There, that was not too offensive, he hoped. Pray do not concern yourself. He is well, Miss Elizabeth replied, without taking her attention from the babe. My good man! Mrs. Bennet pulled a handkerchief from where she had previously tucked it in her sleeve, to wave it about like a flag of surrender. My son is hardy. Of course he was not always so robust, for you see he was so small when he was born that I... Tears pooled in the corner of her eyes. Her hands clutched at her chest, the handkerchief deadly still. I feared he would not make it through the first night, Mr. Darcy. You see, he is not the only son born to Mr. Bennet and me. The others, they... Well, we only have Thomas. She may have been silly. She may have brazenly pushed her daughters forward, like every other matron he knew. However, before him stood a mother, with a heart brimming with affection for her child. Darcy had no doubt in his mind that she would slay dragons for the boy, that she would do everything within her power, and beyond, to protect her son from harm. Chagrin jolted his insides. He had misjudged her. Had he misjudged Miss Elizabeth as well? Of course he had. She was certainly handsome enough to tempt him many times over. Silence filled the room, broken only by the sound of the jewel-encrusted bracelets adorning Mrs. Hurst's wrists clinking together. Darcy was on unstable ground. He knew not how to proceed. Elizabeth offered, Mamma, 
I will gladly remain here with Tommy, should you and my sisters want to check on Jane. She would be delighted to see you, and I know you need reassurance that we are doing all that is possible to ease her discomfort. Yes, Lizzie, you are indeed correct. Mrs. Bennet's fingers lingered on her son's cheek as she moved towards the doorway. Come, girls. Before vacating the room, she glanced back at her daughter and son, then smiled. You will make a wonderful mother some day, Lizzie. Thank you, Mamma. Elizabeth blushed as she watched her family walk from the room. Turning back to her hostess, Elizabeth inquired, Miss Bingley, might I show my brother your library so you can enjoy the quiet of the room in peace? Pray do, was Miss Bingley's immediate reply. Darcy, on the other hand, did not want either of the Bennets to leave. In fact, his desire was to follow them to the one room at Netherfield Park that had become his sanctuary. There, he determined he would pursue peace with both the lady and the lad. Nonetheless, his mind knew the danger of seeking her out. His heart, on the other hand, knew nothing of the kind. Miss Elizabeth set the child on the floor and took his hand to guide him out of the drawing room. The little boy gazed up at his sister with awe. Then he turned to look back into the room at Darcy. Da! he uttered, grinning. It was enough to motivate Darcy's feet to follow where his heart yearned for him to go. Pausing long enough to take a deep breath, Darcy regained control of himself. He needed to consider his next steps closely. As a gentleman, he knew he would need to offer her a sincere apology for his words and actions at the assembly. He also felt the need to apologise for Miss Bingley's condescension of the Bennet family. Retiring to his private sitting room, instead of following Miss Elizabeth to the library, was one of the hardest decisions he had made in a long time. He sighed. What was he to do about that sweet boy and his sister? In truth, he had not a clue. Three. The conversation at the dinner table was carried by Miss Bingley's attempt to capture and hold Mr Darcy's focus upon herself. Elizabeth longed to both chuckle and shake her head at the lady's efforts. It was as apparent as the long, slender nose on her hostess's face that Mr Darcy was not interested in anything she had to offer, including the vegetable course. Elizabeth was seated next to Mr Hurst, a man singularly absorbed in the meal. When the footman held out the tureen to her, she was repelled to find it was Brussels sprouts, swimming in butter and onions. Yuck! Over the years, the cook at Longbourn had prepared them multiple ways, but none was satisfactory. With the exception of her and Tommy, everyone else in her family enjoyed the stinky little cabbages. To learn that she and Mr Darcy had something in common was an unpleasant discovery. Nonetheless, Elizabeth was certain she would recover from her shock with equanimity. Grinning, she applied herself to the rest of the meal, contented with the silence at her end of the table. When the ladies separated from the gentlemen, Elizabeth followed Mrs Hurst and Miss Bingley to the drawing-room, which fortunately no longer bore evidence of little Tommy's presence. The table had been repositioned next to the chair Mr Darcy preferred. It was no surprise to her when Miss Bingley chose it for her seat. Caroline Bingley preened as the men unexpectedly followed behind. Eliza, as your sister noted earlier, your mother is rather of an age to be filling her nursery. I would think she would leave the childbearing to her daughters, once someone can be found to marry any of you. Caroline, Bingley remonstrated. Mr Darcy and Mr Hurst remained silent. Since her arrival at Netherfield Park the day before, Elizabeth had been the victim of several petty attacks against her character and her family from the Bingley females. It flouted every law of propriety and decorum to make someone else's personal business your own. An elegant lady airing her opinions of another in public simply was not done. For all of Miss Bingley's pride in her schooling, she demonstrated a decided lack of appropriate manners. Deciding to rise above rather than lower herself to the same gutter her hostess inhabited, Elizabeth sought at least a fragment of humour in the insult against her mother. A response was needed. Inhaling deeply, she counted to ten before replying. I comprehend how the circumstances of the working class would lend itself to the cessation of more mouths to feed as soon as possible in a marriage. For a family with two centuries in the gentry, as the Bennets are, 
Healthy babies are always welcomed. She had not intended her reply to sound petty, but it did to her own ears. As it was, it stoked the fires of her hostess's ire. Well, I never. Pressing her hand to her chest, Miss Bingley sputtered, Those families who are still involved in trade would be in those circumstances. We are distanced from the factories, Eliza Bennet. My brother is as much a gentleman as your father. Elizabeth's right eye twitched. She knew without looking in the mirror that her brow had risen to astronomical heights. Of all the ridiculous things to say. Within minutes of the Bingley's arrival becoming known in Hertfordshire, the speculation as to his income and their known history had flown from house to house faster than a falcon. The Bingley fortune came from their father's factories in the north of England. They still had muddy soil on their boots from their deep roots in the merchant class. Mr Bingley showed no evidence of shame with the source of his income. It was readily apparent that the Bingley sisters had selective memories of their past. Mr Darcy cleared his throat, then spoke. My parents were married five years before I was born, seventeen years when Georgiana arrived. My mother was thirty-eight and my father forty-seven. I have no doubt that had my mother survived my sister's birth, my parents would have welcomed another child with joy of heart. He looked directly at Elizabeth. Your mother cannot be much more than that. She is just turned forty-three, Elizabeth replied, dumbfounded that a man who had shown nothing but disdain for the Bennets had defended them by sharing information that put her own mother in league with his. Wait, that was not entirely true. Mr Darcy had not shown contempt for all of the Bennets. He had welcomed Tommy into his arms, only reluctantly handing him over when asked. He had not displayed antipathy towards her mother when she was overcome. His expression when her mamma spoke about how precious her son was to her evoked a sympathetic look rather than derision. What was happening? Who was this man? Elizabeth peered at him closely to find the same tall fellow with dark wavy hair, deep brown eyes, a strong jaw, broad shoulders and an impeccably folded cravat, large hands and... Elizabeth stopped herself right there. Good heavens! How had she not realised until that moment what a handsome, well-formed man he was? Mr Darcy was highly attractive. Searing heat rose from the pit of her stomach to her cheeks. Had she a fan, she would have used it to cool herself. Oh, Lord! How would she explain that to the gathering? The autumn chill had infiltrated the large rooms of Netherfield Park and would not leave until late spring. Embarrassment flooded her from head to toe. Goodness! Glancing around the room to see if anyone noticed her plight, Elizabeth found Mr Bingley still glaring at his youngest sister, Mr Hurst resting on the sofa, Mrs Hurst taking her bracelets off her wrist to stack on the table in front of her, only to place them back where they had been, and Miss Bingley with her nose in the air and her face turned away from Mr Darcy. His correction of her opinion had apparently not been appreciated. When Elizabeth's eyes lit on the man himself, she was disconcerted to find him looking right back at her. Instead of his eyes being flint-like, they were warm, the muscles of his face relaxed. Rather than stubbornly insisting on being the last to look away, she dropped her eyes, grabbed a piece of sewing from the work basket left in the drawing room for that purpose, and began to sew. She hated sewing. Darcy forgot to breathe. The candlelight flickering beside her highlighted the roses in Elizabeth's cheeks. Her long, thick lashes framed the most beautiful eyes he had ever seen. How had he ever thought her merely tolerable to look upon? He was a fool. If the Bennet's circumstances had been similar to his own, he would have considered her for the position as the future Mrs Darcy, mistress of Pemberley. Unbidden came the word picture Mrs Bennet had painted of him standing alongside his wife and child. Yearning for the impossible filled his chest to the point of pain. Reason quickly asserted itself as he picked up the book that he had left on the table earlier. Fortunately, the accident with the tea had not damaged the cover or any of the pages. He chuckled to himself. That lad had been determined to reach him. His little body seemed to be about two steps ahead of his feet. Surely little Thomas had not been walking long, as his gait was unsteady. 
remembering the weight of him, nestled in his arms, brought such a feeling of contentment and peaceful longing to Darcy that he almost sighed. His father had raised him to be a family man, to put the needs and care of those who were his own above all others. Until that day, until the presence of Elizabeth and Thomas, he had not spent much time considering how solitary his life had become. For a certainty, he had friends and family, yet they had their own lives too. Even his sister, who recently turned sixteen, had her society of friends as she spent her days with her companion, Mrs. Annesley. Darcy was lonely. "'How is our dear Georgiana? Why, she must have grown to be an elegant young lady!' Caroline Bingley's nasal tone intruded into his introspection. "'I have never met a girl as accomplished as she is. Why, I do believe no skill is beyond her. Do you not agree?' It took a second for Darcy to recall he had spoken of his mother and sister to the room, in defence of Mrs. Bennet. "'My sister as well.' He knew Miss Bingley craved association with the upper ten thousand, and gauged his inexperienced sister as her entry to the ton. "'Does she stay with your aunt, the Countess?' Miss Bingley's eyes darted to Elizabeth, looking to see if she was impressed. "'How is your aunt, Mr. Darcy?' "'Will she be holding her winter ball this year at their house in London? "'I know for a fact it is the society event of the holiday season. "'I would love to attend some day.' "'Hm. Yes, I suppose she will have the ball.' "'Darcy hated large gatherings, where people pretended to like one another "'when they really were seeking to take advantage. "'The Bingley sisters were that sort. "'Charles Bingley was an entirely different breed than his rapacious siblings.' He was the least pretentious man of Darcy's acquaintance. Darcy looked to his left to find Elizabeth's attention solely upon her work. It was as he expected. None of the Bennets, not even the mother, had sought him out, despite him being the nephew of an earl. His uncle, Malcolm Fitzwilliam, was a powerful man with a property almost as large as Pemberley in the Matlock area of Derbyshire. For as often as Bingley's sisters asked Darcy about his relatives... The Bennets had not. How refreshing. Before he could formulate a coherent thought to draw her into the conversation, Miss Elizabeth, or Elizabeth as he now considered her, set aside the needlework and excused herself from the room to return to her sister above stairs. The air seemed to leave with her. Within a hair's breadth, Miss Bingley was denigrating their female guests. Darcy found that he had had enough of her self-promotion at another's expense. "'Bingley, the weather looks to be fair tomorrow. Mightn't we invite Mrs. Bennet and her children to Netherfield Park to monitor the health of Miss Bennet?' Any mention of the name Bennet brought a huge grin to Bingley's face. What it did to Miss Bingley and Mrs. Hurst was far from positive or attractive. What it did to him was another matter altogether.' Four. Darcy could not believe how eagerly anticipated was the youngest Bennet's arrival. Unfortunately, the Thomas Bennet who stepped out of the carriage was far from being a toddler, and certainly far less adorable. Gratefully, the father was accompanied by his son. After alighting, Mr. Bennet took the babe from his wife, then assisted her from the carriage. Rather than returning the boy to Mrs. Bennet, the patriarch of Longbourn carried his son up the steps of the portico where Darcy and Bingley welcomed the visitors to Netherfield Park. The three younger daughters of the squire had remained at home. Miss Bingley, along with Mr and Mrs Hurst, had stayed in the drawing-room. Baby Thomas had little interest in the large edifice in front of him, or the two men waiting to welcome him to Netherfield Park. Instead, his eyes were solidly fixed on the horses, as they impatiently shuffled their hooves, awaiting the command to proceed. When one of them snorted, the baby laughed joyously, clapping his hands. "'Come, Thomas,' Mr. Bennet patted the youngster on the back as his wife took his arm. "'We must not keep the gentleman waiting.' Still the child did not break his focus on the animals. Darcy appreciated that about the lad. It was very much like himself. From his earliest memories, horses fascinated him. Stepping into the entrance hall, Mr. Bennet carefully set the child on the floor at his wife's feet. "'I thank you for your invitation, Mr Bingley. "'If I might be taken to see my Jane, please.' "'Of course,' Bingley replied, "'calling the housekeeper, 
who had been standing by for assistance. Since the day prior, Darcy found himself seriously reconsidering his first impressions of the Bennet family. Rather than discovering the master of Longbourn to be an indifferent sort, Mr. Bennet's reference to his eldest as his, and his desire to first see to her health, proved he was as devoted to his family as Mrs. Bennet. For some unknown reason, this pleased Darcy. Papa, I can direct you to Jane's bedchamber if you please, Elizabeth said, as she descended the stairs to greet her family. Is he? Little Thomas shot from his mother's side to run to his sister. Lizzie, how good to see you this fine October morning. Mr. Bennet was slower and had a much smoother gait. Kissing his daughter on the cheek before she gave her attention to her brother, he added, I believe your mother is as anxious as I to see our girl. Mightn't you care for your brother for a moment? Gladly. Before her parents had taken their first step up the staircase, Elizabeth took Thomas in her arms and spun in a circle. The babe threw back his head and laughed. Pure joy filled the hall. When she stopped, they were facing Darcy. Da! Thomas pointed his pudgy finger directly at him. Darcy's chest tingled at being remembered. The area around his heart almost buzzed with something so foreign to him that he caught himself rubbing his chest to ease the sensation. Mr. Bennet shook his head. So, you are the da my son chattered about all day yesterday. Mr. Darcy. Da, I wondered. Smiling, he resumed his journey up the stairs. Da! The boy wiggled until Elizabeth placed his feet on the floor. Once his small boots barely skimmed the surface, Thomas charged directly for Darcy, the same as the day prior. Fortunately, there were no tea tables in his path. The boy crashed into Darcy's legs, threw his hands up into the air and grunted, Da! Mm! There was absolutely no question the lad was insisting that Darcy pick him up. There was also no telling the boy no, not that Darcy had any intention of doing anything other than the little lad's pleasure. Sliding Thomas to one side, Darcy offered his arm to Elizabeth, as Mr. Bennet had done to his wife. Her fingers barely touched his sleeve, yet every paw underneath came alive. Mr. Bennet, look! Mrs. Bennet's voice easily travelled the length of the room. Are they not perfectly situated? Do they not appear the image of a happy family? I'm sure Mr. Darcy has far too many things on his mind to spend time fantasising about setting up his nursery at his great estate, Mrs. Bennet. Now come, let us attend our Jane. Their conversation trailed off, leaving an extremely uncomfortable Darcy and Elizabeth behind. Pray forgive my mother's fanciful imaginings, sir. Her old habit of fretting about the entail lingers despite Tommy's good health. She means well. Darcy considered her words carefully. This I have no doubt. Da! The boy's palm against Darcy's cheek redirected the man's attention from his sister. Da! Go! Mr. Darcy, you have now learned Tommy's favourite word. From the time he learned to move about on his hands and knees, he would shoot off for parts unknown. His speed at getting from one point to another is legendary at Longbourn. By nine months of age, his stealth and cunning caused more consternation than you could know. Many times we thought him safely positioned with his toys, only to blink and discover him gone. Darcy chuckled, his arms instinctively clasping the lad tighter. How could anyone ever lose the precious child? Upon their foray into the drawing room, Bingley attempted to steal the baby away from Darcy, using funny faces and acting the fool. Thomas watched the man with pleasure, but failed to budge away from Darcy's arms. The pride at knowing he was preferred by the child shook Darcy. Miss Bingley ignored both Bennets, which added to Darcy's pleasure. Mr. Hurst convinced his wife to take a short walk through the garden. As they left the room, both glared at the baby, apparently for disturbing their peace. Darcy was not a prophet, of course, but it did not appear there would be a babe in the nursery at the Hurst house in the near future. What a shame! Sir, before my brother becomes restless, you should know that if you want him to remain in place for long, Tommy enjoys stories. I can foresee him being a great reader once he learns, Elizabeth said. Then he shall become an accomplished gent, I suspect. 
Darcy sat next to Elizabeth, which pleased the lad. Is he? He leaned over to rub his nose on the side of her cheek. Love you. I love you too, Tommy boy. She kissed his forehead, bringing her exceedingly close to Darcy. She must have felt the discomfort of the proximity, since she leaned back, smiling only at the boy. Ignoring the heat on his own cheeks, Darcy asked, A story, you say? And what sort is most entertaining to him? Her smile lit the room. He enjoys adventure and mystery. What boy does not? Or girl? The light in Elizabeth's eyes danced, delighting Darcy. He nodded. Or girl? He cleared his throat to buy him time. His mind, instead of attempting to recall a tale that had satisfied his sister at that age, spun senselessly with the hint of roses from the lady seated close to him. Da! Thomas wiggled, the universal move for a child to be put down. Elizabeth proved to be his saviour, for Darcy was not quite ready to let him go. Story time? That one word was all it took for Thomas to become still, put his thumb in his mouth and settle in. Darcy had not realised he had been holding his breath until the child's head relaxed upon his chest. A feeling of invincibility almost overpowered him. As Elizabeth began her tale of pirates on the high seas, Darcy pondered his plight. When he had departed London for Hertfordshire, he had not considered how a baby would change his life until Thomas. It was disruptive to say the least, but it was also good. Poor Mr. Darcy, tied to the mast by a one-armed bandit with a patch on his eye and a long, sharp sword in his hand. Who would save the man? Darcy wanted to laugh. What? I am so defenceless as to be captured and held by a man with only one arm. How little you think of me, Miss Elizabeth. Pretending offence was a new emotion for him, one appreciated by the lady and the lad. Flexing his free arm, he showed the boy his muscles, only to have the lad try to do the same. When he felt the child's bicep, Thomas burst into giggles. The boy immediately felt Darcy's arm. Then Elizabeth was required to demonstrate her own strength. Apparently, they were able to prove their power was as considerable as the boy's because he grunted, More! More, you say? Elizabeth teased. Well, I do not know, Tommy boy. Mr. Darcy appears to be strong enough to escape on his own. Do you think he needs help? Vigorously nodding his head, the boy looked up at Darcy. Da! Yes, Mr. Darcy is indeed captive on a pirate ship, Elizabeth grinned. He thinks Tommy needs to come to his rescue. Do you have your sword? The lad's arm shot out with his fingers in a tight fist, as if he were gripping a weapon. Thomas started bouncing himself on Darcy's lap. A horse? Elizabeth put her finger to her chin. Mm, I do not know. If you were tied up inside a runaway carriage, you would certainly need your fastest steed. Yet, on a boat... Horse! Thomas blurted. Well, young hero, we shall need to change the story completely for you to have a horse, Elizabeth admitted. Horse! As soon as the word left his mouth, his little thumb popped back inside. Do you have any ideas, sir? Looking into eyes so like her brother's, he had no idea at all. Breaking contact, a thought struck him. Lowering his voice, Darcy began. It was a dark and stormy night. The gentleman was in his... study, caring for estate business, when two... no, four men with pistols crashed through the door, demanding he give them money, or they would kidnap his favourite... cousin. The man first tried to plead with the bandits, but the thieves would not listen. When he had the lad's complete attention, he continued... As the men forced him from his house, there was a lady and her little brother crossing the street in their direction. Realising the two were witnesses to their crime, two of the men rushed at the lad and the lady and grabbed them. Darcy's hand shot out like lightning to lightly grab the lad's arm. He squealed with delight. More! Do not fear, Thomas, for you will have more. Now, where was I? he asked. The child bounced in his lap. Ah, yes. Horses, Darcy chuckled. Me, the boy blurted, before Darcy could add to his story. 
He's asking you to refer to him as Tommy rather than Thomas, as my mother prefers. I see. Of course, I will, since Tommy sounds much more like the name of a hero than does Thomas. Darcy tickled the lad under the chin, then became entirely serious. The men pushed the lady and her brother into the carriage, where two of the men held guns on the gentleman. The lady began to cry from fear. Is he, sir? Tommy asked then glanced at his sister to make sure she was well. Yes, she was very sad, because she was taking the boy to the corner market for a sweet. Mm, Mummy! His tongue peeked out to run over his lips. Yes, well, now the boy was hurrying down a street with threatening strangers, and a gentleman of the finest sort, in a carriage. The horses were moving fast, almost too fast for the area of town they were in. Tommy knew it would be up to him to save his sister and the gentleman. Him being so young and small, the rogues would never suspect a mere boy to have the skills to rescue them. What the ruffians did not know was how strong the lad was. As the carriage rounded one corner entirely too fast, the passengers were flung against the door. Using the distraction as an opportunity, Tommy picked up a knife that one of the rakes had dropped. Using the darkness to protect his movements, Tommy slid the sharp blade to the gentleman, then climbed on his sister's lap to offer her comfort. It was then that the leader discovered his dagger was gone. Darcy's voice dropped to a whisper. How would they be rescued from this mess? Me, Tommy offered. Oh, yes, young man, you are to be the hero in this tale. For you see, when all seemed to be lost, you grabbed your sister's reticule containing an assortment of handkerchiefs, pieces of paper, a few coins, and her favourite book of poetry. Flinging her purse as hard as you could, it hit the leader squarely in the face, almost blinding him. As the bandit struggled to regain his composure, the gentleman overpowered the other ruffian. To make sure his sister was truly safe, Tommy climbed from her lap to grab the reticule from where the leader tossed it, only to fling it at the man again. He threw that purse and threw that purse and threw that purse, until the leader finally raised his hands in surrender. Taking the opportunity to glance at the others in the room, he found Miss Bingley completely spellbound by his silly little story, and Bingley had drawn close to hear every word. Miss Elizabeth smiled delightfully. Tommy might be far too young to have comprehended the details of the story, but he understood facial expressions and gestures vividly. Ma! Tommy begged. Certainly we need to have the ending, do we not? Darcy considered how best to end his work of fiction. Once the carriage returned to the gentleman's home, the constable and the gentleman's cousin, a man of many battles, seized the criminals and had them thrown into prison. A newspaper reporter came and wrote a report of how one Tommy Bennett of Longbourn in Hertfordshire saved the day by his quick thinking and power. The gentleman and the lady were happy to have a hero in their midst. Ummy! The boy looked up at him expectantly. Ah, yes, I had forgotten although I see that you have not. Darcy continued his improvisation. To celebrate the boy's victory over evil, the gentleman and his cousin, the lad's sister, and their good friends the Bingleys boarded a fine carriage for Gunters, where they enjoyed tea, cakes, and fruit-flavoured ices. Then they were all of them pleased. The child clapped his hands. So did the others in the room. From the doorway, Mr. Bennet spoke. As a man with six females in his house, I shall remember to borrow a reticule should I need to cause a hardened criminal to lose his composure. Bravo, Mr Darcy. Well done. Pop, pop! Young Tommy slid from Darcy's lap as soon as he heard his father's voice. Darcy stood, out of respect for the man. Thank you, sir, Elizabeth smiled up at him. Your story was highly entertaining. Highly implausible, I would say. He was embarrassed with her praise. True, but entertaining no less. Lizzie, your mother and Jane require your presence. Mr Bennet lifted his son from the ground and entered the room. Darcy felt the loss of her with her first step away from him, forcing his eyes back to the lad so Mr Bennet would not be witness to them trailing after his daughter. Darcy settled back on the sofa, wondering whether the conversation would flow with the father like it had with his children. His concerns were entirely unwarranted. Before a few minutes passed, Miss Bingley had vacated the room. Bingley followed shortly behind, 
leaving Darcy and Mr. Bennet discussing books. The conversation was exhilarating. When Mrs. Bennet and Elizabeth appeared almost an hour later, it was a challenge to break away from their discussion of Shakespeare's opinions on government. Within the time it took to inhale and exhale once, their world tipped on end. Little Tommy was no longer in the room. Five. Minutes after Mr. and Mrs. Hurst returned to the drawing room, it was discovered that the child was not the only thing missing at Netherfield Park. One of Mrs. Hurst's jewelled bracelets, the garnet encrusted one, was also gone. Mrs. Hurst swooned. Miss Bingley attended her sister, offering her deepest sympathies for the jewellery, completely ignoring the seriousness of a lost child. As Bingley and Mr. Hurst looked under the chairs and tables for the jewellery, Mr. Darcy and the Bennet searched for Tommy. Elizabeth's poor mother was a wreck. Thus she encouraged her father to remain with his wife in the drawing-room, so the two of them, along with Netherfield's staff, could concentrate their search. At first they all spread out in hopes of a rapid recovery. Mr. Darcy checked the downstairs hallways, looking under each table and behind each curtain. The servants went below stairs. Elizabeth chose to start with the first doorway to her left, which happened to be the sparsely stocked library. It took little time to determine her brother was not there. After diligently entering and exiting each room, she met Mr. Darcy coming from the other direction. Can he open doors? Yes, he can. What about stairs? Can he climb them? He has not done so before. Mamma has told him over and over not to try. She fears him falling. She is correct to warn him, as it has happened to others. Darcy distractedly rubbed his forehead. Would he do it anyway? Would you have gone against the rules when you were young? Ha! <laughs> Elizabeth exclaimed. I believe you know the answer already, sir. Pray let the staff here know to continue the search while we head upstairs. Once they ascended to the top, she went to the left and he to the right. The first door was a sitting room in a much simpler style than the public rooms below. It seemed Miss Bingley had not yet begun decorating this portion of the house. Checking under the bed, in the wardrobe, and in the travelling trunks, which were haphazardly piled in one corner, Elizabeth met with no success. Elizabeth had no doubt the next room was Miss Bingley's. Gold and deep burgundy were the ladies' colours of choice, which made for a dark space, with shards of light reflecting through the window. Systematically checking any area that a curious Tommy would investigate— Elizabeth wondered at the abundance of gowns lined up in a row like neat soldiers in the closet. The shades of reds and pinks reminded her of the overly decorated confections imported from London and sold during special times of the year at Meryton's Bakery. It only took one time of overindulging for Elizabeth to reject sampling more than one of the cloying sweets from her youth on. After a thorough search, she quit the room for the next. She felt like a snoop. Mr. and Mrs. Hurst obviously did not share adjoining rooms, as most married couples did. Where one Bingley sister preferred dark and garish, this one looked like she was not able to come to terms with a single theme. Every surface was covered with an abundance of decorations in every shade of the rainbow. Oranges mixed with blues, greens with reds, yellows and purples vied with aquamarine, violet and peach. It was the work of a moment to realise that Tommy would have wanted to investigate everything the chamber contained. However, there had not been a crash loud enough to alert them that he was in the room. Backing out into the hall, Elizabeth closed the door, in time for Mr Darcy to exit from the door opposite hers. No success, he asked. None. The next one is Bingley's room. The one after is occupied by me. Not currently, I would assume. Ha! <laughs> He grinned, then frowned as he surveyed the hallway. Jane is the next chamber on my side. Tommy would not have entered, or Mamma would have seen him. That is true. He hesitated. Miss Elizabeth, under normal circumstances, I would not allow anyone other than Thornton, my valet, to enter my private chambers. However, since he is searching downstairs with the others, I would ask that you perform the task, since I would despise myself if I overlooked some clue due to my familiarity with my surroundings. I, of course, will remain in the hallway. Me! Elizabeth's voice rose an octave. She understood the wisdom of the request, but, good heavens, his room? Very well, 
"'There is one room remaining on my side of the hallway after Jane's. "'Should you search there, I will do as you ask. "'Pray allow me to check with Jane, "'just in case Tommy entered after Mamma departed for the drawing-room. "'My brother is fast, and as I mentioned before, stealthy.' "'While Mr. Darcy gave Mr. Bingley's room a thorough once over, "'Elizabeth checked with Jane. "'Her sister was wide awake, "'concerned with all their mother's wailing "'and the opening and closing of doors.' Tommy went missing while Mamma and I were with you. I suspect he found one of Mrs. Hurst's bracelets and took it with him wherever he went, as the one she left on the table where she was seated is no longer there. Oh, no! Jane threw back the bedclothes to search for her slippers. I shall help you find him. Seeing her sister sway before clasping the bedpost, Elizabeth ordered her back to bed. Have you been awake since we left your room? Elizabeth was direct. They had no time to waste. "'I do not believe I even blinked. "'Very well. "'Pray take care, dear sister. "'I shall notify you as soon as our brother is found.' "'Excusing herself, Elizabeth moved to Mr. Darcy's chambers, "'which he had gratefully opened. "'Since he was still in Mr. Bingley's room, Elizabeth entered. "'His chambers were very much like what she knew of the man. "'In all their association, Mr. Darcy never failed to present himself "'as well-dressed without being pretentious.' His shirts were clean, unwrinkled and brilliant white. His coat was neatly pressed. Like him, the room appeared neat and orderly. Even the pile of books on the side table next to his bed were stacked carefully with the largest books on the bottom. Curiosity forced her to peek at the title on the top. Shakespeare's sonnets. Poetry. She would not have thought it of a man as severe and constrained as Mr. Darcy. Hmm... Tommy was not under his bed. However, the man's slippers were. His feet were huge. She quickly checked the wardrobe, pushing aside the long greatcoats in case her brother had chosen to hide there. Nothing except fine fabrics that smelled like... him. Searching the sitting room, under and behind the furniture, proved futile. No, Tommy. Elizabeth had been moving so fast that she had not taken time to think. Nevertheless, returning to the hallway to see Mr. Darcy stepping outside of the room empty-handed hit her hard. Frustration and fear swirled around them. No celebratory cry had come up from downstairs as of yet, which meant her brother still had not been found. It was in every way horrible. She could not stop the tears that threatened to fall. Mr. Darcy? He touched her arm in comfort. We will find him. He is so small. Elizabeth sniffed as her eyes darted from one surface to the next in hopes of locating her brother. This house is so big. Darcy too looked around. That it is. Rubbing his jaw, he mused. We know him to be able to open doors and climb stairs. Does he ever venture outside on his rambles? No, he never has. Hope rose in her chest, along with the fear of a babe being in the cold. Hertfordshire weather could change from cool mornings and sunny days to a torrential rain within moments. Glancing out the nearest window showed that the blue skies had already transformed to a gloomy grey. Without a word, they both started towards the staircase. Theirs was not a leisurely stroll. His long legs devoured the length of the hallway. Reaching back, he took her hand in his, pulling Elizabeth along. Frantic worry about her brother kept her from noticing the tingles where his skin touched hers. Almost. By the time they descended the stairs and crossed the entrance hall, they were moving even quicker. On the front portico, as his eyes swept the front lawn, he asked, Would his interest have taken him to the stables? She heard the tremor in his voice. It served to increase a fear that was threatening to overtake her. Tommy had taken off to pursue his own interests so many times in the five months since he had learned to crawl that it had become fairly routine. Thus, when he was first reported as missing, Elizabeth was more casual about his disappearance. Yet at Longbourn, he was easily found since they now knew his haunts. He favoured the cat's bed in their father's study, curling up in the blankets until he fell asleep, while his pot-pot read. Another favourite was the chairs under the dining table. Crawling a path through the chair legs appeared to challenge his skills, for he always squealed delightedly when he went from one end to the other. Thus they were able to locate him easily. But this? 
This was terrifying. I will have the grooms search the stables and the grounds between there and the house. Pray go to the gardens to see if your brother wandered there. Nodding, Elizabeth started to move, only to be stopped by the firm pressure of his hand on hers. We will find him safely, Darcy reassured her, his eyes piercing hers. Thank you. Breaking eye contact, bowing to herself to later consider how easily she had allowed him to take and keep her hand in his, she ran towards the path to the south of the estate. Well-trimmed hedges and late-blooming flowers bordered the walkways. Running up and down each path, Elizabeth scanned under every shrub and tree for the presence of a little boy. Nothing. Cursing to herself at the vastness of the gardens, she hurried even faster. Moisture dripped from her temples and dotted her upper lip, despite the coolness of the air. No, that was wrong. The air was cold. Far too chilly for a little boy without a coat and hat to protect him. Tommy! Elizabeth continued to yell. From a distance, she heard men's voices doing the same. Reaching the fountain at the far end, Elizabeth spun in a circle, her sight blurred by tears she could no longer contain. Tommy! Her heart ached until the pressure in her chest was real. Pausing to think, Elizabeth returned to Mr Darcy's question about what Tommy could do. He was only a year old. Nonetheless, his propensity for adventure and freedom from restraint had the lad reaching for more and more skills above his age. Pressing her hand to her brow, a sickening thought threatened to stir the contents of her stomach. Water. Tommy loved his bath, mud puddles and walking with Elizabeth by the stream. He would diligently look for frogs and fishes or ogs and isses. The pond. Down the slope of Netherfield's front lawns was a man-made water feature, so deep that Elizabeth and her sisters used to spend summer days with the daughter of the former occupant, dangling their bare feet in the cool water. It was one of the great fishing holes in their part of the shire. At one end the water was deep and dark, with large boulders that had been hauled in to provide a safe place for the fish to grow large enough to be a prize on anyone's table. Good Lord! Running as fast as she was able, she rounded the corner of the house to find Mr Darcy already hurrying down the lawn. That he had had the same idea as her scared Elizabeth even more. Tommy! No! Six. Darcy stopped on the grass before the muddy shoreline dropped down to the water's edge. In the five feet between where his feet were planted and where the pond began, there was not one little footprint. Tommy had not been to the pond. Relief exploded inside him, weakening his muscles and robbing him of the ability to inhale. Bending at the waist, he gripped his knees until his head stopped spinning. No, 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 Elizabeth screamed as she grabbed his arm and shook him. Turning into him, she shielded her eyes by burying her face in the fabric at his shoulder. No, dear God, no, she sobbed. When her knees gave way, Darcy grabbed her, wrapping her in his arms. Her hands clutched his lapels as her heart broke in two. Her pain flowed through his veins until he could offer nothing but reassurance and solace. For her, the comfort was needed first. His arms tightened, his mouth lowered until he could speak softly into her ear. Elizabeth, Tommy is not in the pond. We do not know exactly where he is yet but he is not in the water. Was that his heart, pounding like a galloping horse that wild? Elizabeth, Tommy is not in the pond. He repeated several times, until she quieted. What? she sniffed, pulling slightly back from him. What did you say? Look. He pointed to the muddy beach. There are no footprints, large or small. No one has been here since the last rain. Thank God! Her eyes closed as she stepped away from him to tip her head back in supplication. When her hands dropped from his chest, he wanted to beg her to put them back where they belonged, where it felt like the most natural place they should be. Tommy, Elizabeth whispered, her eyes scanning back towards the house. Tommy, where are you? Settling himself, Darcy took her hand to assist her back up the slope. 
he knew it was a sorry excuse to keep in contact. His own nerves were frayed with the knowledge that it was he and Mr. Bennet who had been so involved in conversation that they had not kept a proper eye on the child. If asked, Darcy could recollect that not many passed during which the two repeatedly expressed their opinions. But would that have been the truth? No. What seemed like a few moments could have been a quarter of an hour, or slightly more. As they hurried up the hill, Elizabeth said, Mr. Darcy, we need to think about this. Did you personally look through the stables? I did. I did the same with the garden. We were both thorough in our search of the upstairs. It appears to me that the weak link in our chain is the downstairs rooms, where neither you nor I personally investigated. What if one of the servants was not as meticulous? What if they had been distracted for a brief second, or their mind wandered to something else? Then I believe you and I need to make an exhaustive search. Darcy stopped, causing her to do the same. Inside the kitchen there is a wine cellar, a still room and a laundry area. The cook here at Netherfield rules her roost with an iron hand. She would notice a baby, even a sneaky one. The laundry area is equally as occupied. A child would never be overlooked. I cannot see Tommy entering a dark room alone. This eliminates the still room and cellar. Is there nothing else downstairs? Darcy closed his eyes to recall the layout from his initial inspection prior to Bingley leasing the estate. Indeed, the housekeeper has her room and office there, as well as the butler. A cook's bedchamber door is next to the large stove in the kitchen. There is a small compartment for linen storage, with no door, in the hallway, between the dining room and kitchen. Elizabeth's head came up, her eyes shining at him. Tommy! Sure enough, after running around the back of the house, they burst through the servant's entrance and approached the linen storage, only to find the toddler. Each shelf was stacked with neatly pressed and folded fabric, except the very bottom. There the cloth had been tugged and wiggled upon until the little boy had made a bed fit for a lad his size. A tablecloth embroidered with a bee on each corner covered him from head to toe. Elizabeth knelt to gently pull back the cloth. What Darcy beheld rocked him back on his feet. Was there anything more wondrous than a sleeping child with the corner of the cloth wadded up in one hand and his thumb in his mouth? Words like serenity, contentment and innocence floated around his mind as he gazed at the little boy. Elizabeth ran her fingers lightly across the lad's cheek. Tommy, she whispered, wake up, dear boy. An entirely inappropriate urge to bump her out of the way grabbed the boy into his arms and hold him tightly, warred with common sense. Neither Bennet would appreciate him if he gave in to his compulsion. Instead, when Elizabeth gathered the lad into her arms, Darcy reached under her elbow to help her stand. He had assumed he had felt the gamut of emotions since it was discovered the boy was gone. However, when she looked up at him with tears in her eyes and a smile on her face, her lips whispering her thanks, Darcy's heart was touched by something entirely unknown to him. In the few times during his adult life that he had considered the possibility of feeling love for a woman, Darcy figured it would hit him like a ton of bricks being dropped from above. This sensation of having a feather stroking inside his chest muscles, only to grow to the caress of a woman's hand, massaging his heart, until he became aware that from that point on it would only beat for her, was unexpected. He needed to consider whether this feeling was welcome. Stepping back away from her and Tommy, Darcy knew his honour required he immediately return their son and daughter to Mr and Mrs Bennet. Once the task was completed, he was no longer under obligation. He could retire to his rooms, leave for his London house, or Pemberley, or freely go anywhere he liked with impunity. Except, bah, the ache inside of him at watching her turn away to return to the drawing-room let him know more than words that he was a fool to think he would ever leave her or let her go. For the first time in nearly twenty-eight years, Fitzwilliam Darcy knew what it was to love. Despite taking what seemed like forever to make the journey from the point where she found out Tommy was missing until they arrived at the linen closet, the distance back to the drawing room was relatively short. It took those few steps to settle Elizabeth's heartbeat to a normal rhythm. She felt like she had run the full three miles from Longbourn to Netherfield Park as fast as her legs could carry her. Her body was weary. 
Elizabeth thought there was not a better feeling in the world than to have her brother safe. It amazed her that with one glimpse of the sleeping child, her worries vanished. Watching his little chest rise and fall in peaceful slumber set her world back on its axis. Mr Darcy's leather soles could be heard right behind her. Elizabeth would be eternally grateful for the man's efforts to locate Tommy. His offer to carry the babe had been refused. Elizabeth would not let her brother go until her mother insisted. Seeing Tommy was one thing, but feeling him in her own arms, listening to the rhythm of his breathing, was exactly what it took to reassure a loved one that he was truly safe. Miss Elizabeth, before we join the others, I need to extend my apologies for placing your brother in danger. I own that it was my fault entirely. There is no excuse for my actions. My honour forbids me passing the blame to another. Elizabeth stopped to look back at the gentleman. His gaze caught hers, refusing to let go. It was his eyes, though, that caught her attention. In them was reflected deep sorrow, a profound repentance that proved beyond measure that his words were genuine. He meant exactly what he said. Was Mr Darcy entirely at fault like he said? And to be fair, Elizabeth was familiar with her father's ways. There had been many times when she had approached her papa in his study to ask his permission for something or other. If he was reading, she often wondered if he had actually diverted his attention from his book long enough to truly understand what it was she had asked of him. "'Sir, I believe that my brother was not left in your care.' Tilting her head to the side, she studied him. His posture reflected humility, something she never expected from him in a million years. "'You are laying claim to a fault that is not yours.' "'I beg to differ,' Mr Darcy replied." She interrupted before he could continue. No, Mr Darcy, you cannot take the blame. Rather, you are to be praised for your efforts to find Tommy. A thought occurred to her. I suspect that having become master of a large estate at a relatively young age has heaped responsibility upon you. Miss Bingley and Mrs Hurst have explained that you are guardian to your sister, who is Lydia's age. This would be an added obligation, especially if she is at all volatile like my sister. I cannot imagine the burdens you bear each day. Thus, I simply cannot allow you to add what happened today to the load you already carry. My father alone knows who should have kept an eye on Tommy. Nonetheless, pray recall how often his ability to escape any one of us has been mentioned since my brother's appearance at Netherfield yesterday. Tommy has a well-deserved reputation. I see. He rubbed his jaw, something she noted he did when agitated. You are correct that my duties are many. My sister is no less dear to me than your brother is to you. Bingley and my cousin have taken me to task for taking too much upon myself. I do believe this is the first time a lady has ever thought to do so. He bowed. Therefore I thank you, Miss Elizabeth, for the relief you offer. However, it shall be a long while before I relieve myself of any accountability. Elizabeth did not know what to think. This man in front of her was nothing like the one who insulted her at the Meryton Assembly. There was not a thread of disdain in the fibre of his being. Who was this man? She knew from the change to Tommy's breathing that his nap was about over. He is about to wake, sir. Then let us return him to his mother. Tommy's thumb popped out of his mouth. Da! His eyes opened at the same time he smiled. Leaning towards the man... Elizabeth could do nothing other than let her brother go. Over the past twenty-four hours, Elizabeth had observed a full range of emotions on Mr Darcy's face. When he smiled in delight at embracing her brother, Elizabeth's heart melted a little more than she wanted. 7. He is found! When Mrs Bennet launched herself from her chair, Darcy fully expected her to grab her son from him. What he failed to take into consideration was the level of emotion stirred in the heart and mind of a frantic mother. Her arms shot around Darcy, sandwiching little Tommy tightly between them. After kissing her son on the cheek, she rather unexpectedly kissed him on the cheek too. "'Oh, thank you, sir,' Mrs Bennet repeated at least a dozen times. Little Tommy thought her actions to be a fun sort of game. First, he would kiss his mother on the cheek, then he would kiss Darcy— Back and forth he went, until his mother finally regained her feet underneath her, 
metaphorically speaking. It was no surprise to Darcy that when Mrs. Bennet finally stepped back from him that she was holding the child. This was it, he figured. This was the moment when she would fling blame at him for the searing anxiety she had experienced over the past half of an hour. He felt Elizabeth's presence alongside him. She will not do it, Mr. Darcy. Elizabeth shook her head slowly. In my whole lifetime, I have only known my mother to hold a grudge or cast blame one time. She glanced around to see if they had privacy before continuing. You see, a reluctant suitor wrote Jane some abominable poetry, then never came again to Longbourn. On that very day, Mamma cursed his name and informed each occupant and servant alike that the man would never be allowed to step one foot inside the house again. To this day, we are uncertain if it was the bad verses he wrote or his neglect that stirred her ire. She grinned. Thus you should understand that now that Tommy is safe, she will forget the part you and father played in losing him in the first place. Papa, I fear, will never hear the end of the trauma she suffered on this day. As far as you are concerned, you will forever be her hero for delivering my brother safely back to her. Hmm, I find you to be in error, Miss Elizabeth, although it is ungentlemanly on my part to point out that you misspoke and it will not paint me with kindness. I easily recall Mrs. Bennet telling me to my face in front of others that I am a disagreeable, horrid man, not at all worth pleasing, and that I was so high and conceited that there would be no enduring me. His breathing was ragged. It was far harder to repeat than it was to have heard it in the first place. Therefore, I believe there might not be one gentleman your mother holds in derision, but two. Her eyes twinkled with merriment. Ah, but Mr. Darcy... Do recall that Mamma called you a hero on the occasion of her speaking, and said her opinion had changed dramatically. Elizabeth rocked up on her toes, clasping her hands behind her back. I believe the last twenty-four hours have seen a remarkable change in the Bennet family's attitude towards you, sir. I do not know what to say. Darcy was genuinely nonplussed. In his circle, the guilty often pointed fingers at innocent ones to distract accusers from finding fault with them. Now that he considered it, the practice was shoddy, far below the dignity that came with his position in society. He had acted inappropriately when he arrived in Hertfordshire. He had been raised to believe in his own superiority. Good Lord! He sounded like his Aunt Catherine, who espoused the belief that elevated rank overruled the need to be gracious to others. Wait, what had she said, exactly? A remarkable change in the Bennet family's attitude. All of the Bennets. He had not known he had spoken aloud until he heard her reply. Yes, Mr. Darcy, I do believe even Lydia finds you tolerable. With a soft chuckle, Elizabeth left his side to attend her mother and brother. What a minx! Whatever was he going to do about her? Whatever was Elizabeth going to do about him? The reality of Mr. Darcy was proving to be as far from her first impressions as the sunrise was from the sunset. Observing his reaction at having her mother embrace him made her feel... warm. The poor man. It had taken far too many seconds before his posture relaxed. Slightly. He was trying, Elizabeth noted. Watching the scene in front of her, she was caught off guard when Miss Bingley approached with fire shooting from her eyes and vengeance oozing from every pore. What unnerved Elizabeth from observing her countenance was that the woman did not yell as expected. Instead, she whispered, I see you found your brother. Yes, Miss Bingley. Nodding in confusion, Elizabeth could not begin to contemplate why her hostess was angry. I know what you have done, she quietly challenged. What in the world is she talking about? Immediately, Elizabeth's mind flew to the shore of the pond, where Darcy had held her, comforted her. Had Miss Bingley been watching through the window? There could be trouble if it became public that he had embraced her, and she had clutched him, as if her life depended on him. Neither were wearing coats or gloves. Who touched who first was unknown to Elizabeth. In every way, they had flouted the rules of propriety. Couples had been forced to marry for much less. Nevertheless, their actions had been born of desperation, not desire. They were innocent in their intentions, if not their actions. 
However, she was not one to be intimidated by another wholly unrelated to her. Having been raised with squabbling sisters proved the motto that being on the offensive was a better tactic than being on the defensive. No, Miss Bingley, I believe you think you know what I have done, for I do not have a clue of what you are speaking. My sister's garnet bracelet is still missing. Where did you hide it, Eliza Bennet? Excuse me? Elizabeth's own ire surged up her chest and out her mouth. I did nothing with Mrs. Hurst's jewellery. Nothing at all. Ha! Caroline Bingley hissed as she stood face to face with Elizabeth. You have spent more time hunting Mr. Darcy than taking care of your sister. Why, Charles invited you to remain yesterday is a mystery to me. You, Eliza, have everything to gain by pilfering something you could never have purchased. Where is it? Did you hide it amongst your well-worn gowns? Did you tuck it between two of the books you brought to read? Did you hand it off to your mother? Is it residing in her reticule as we speak? Is it in your pocket? Inhaling through her nostrils, Elizabeth slowly counted to ten. Only then did she reply. You have ill-judged me, Miss Bingley. I am not guilty of your charges. Elizabeth refused to even blink. Despite the honesty of my words, I do not expect you to believe me. But do let me tell you something, Miss Bingley. Elizabeth stepped close enough that she could feel her hostess's breath on her cheek. No, I will say nothing. Stepping back, she watched Miss Bingley's expression go from pure anger to that strong emotion diluted with curiosity. What? What were you to say for yourself? Not one word. Having two volatile younger sisters, Elizabeth had no doubt what to expect. Once she turned her attention to Tommy, the fuse leading directly to Caroline Bingley's ire was lit. How dare you! Miss Bingley's voice now was far from a whisper. Her fists tightly balled at her sides. She spoke so all would have no difficulty overhearing. You, who have presumed upon my hospitality, have displayed the worst sort of arrogance. I use the word pilfer rather than theft to lighten my charge against you. Nonetheless, your obstinate, headstrong attitude flouts the goodness we have offered you and your family. What you have done breaks the law. I should call the constable immediately. I say, return the bracelet to me now, and I will allow you to leave unscathed. If not, I will call the full force of the law down upon your miserable fine eyes. Caroline! Her brother was flummoxed. Extend your apologies now. I insist. Miss Bingley! Darcy barked as he returned to Elizabeth's side. Almost from the moment Miss Elizabeth walked into the drawing room, We were together searching for the child. There would have been no opportunity for her to have strolled to the table where your sister laid her jewellery without several of us seeing her. Her fine eyes have trapped you, sir, until you are blinded to her true character. Miss Bingley lifted her chin, displaying her supposed superiority. She is nothing to people like us. Were Eliza to journey to London, she would be overlooked by those in our circle. Approaching Mr. Darcy, she pointed her finger at his chest. "'Who are you, and what have you done with Mr. Darcy of Pemberley and Darcy House in London, son of Lady Anne Darcy, nephew of Lord Fitzwilliam, the Earl of Matlock? I have studied you during all four years you have known my brother. Never have I witnessed you willingly mingling with the lower classes. Never!' "'I am a gentleman, Miss Bingley,' Mr. Darcy replied, his tone crisp. Mr. Bennet is also a gentleman. In this we are equals. I do have family of rank and status. Are you so certain that Mr. Bennet does not also? Whether this is the case, I care not. Your claim of knowing my character is flawed. You have never been privy to my private thoughts. You have no knowledge of my dreams, my hopes or my goals. There are two individuals alone who are privy to this information, and you are not one of those two, nor will you ever be. Pardon me, Mr. Bennet entered the fray. I do not doubt that a Bennet is responsible for the missing bracelet. He opened his mouth to continue, but was stopped by Miss Bingley. There, her own father agrees with me. What have you to say to that, Mr. Darcy? I say we listen to what the man has to say. 
Miss Bingley, I can see that you are upset, and rightfully so. Mr. Bennet remained calm. My son has a fascination with shiny objects, but Longbourn we have had to perform an extensive search in areas within the lad's reach for items that were taken with no ill intent. Lately, he has begun to throw anything he has in his hand. He has little skill, so small objects can fly in all directions. I suspect the same has happened with the bracelet. Therefore, I suggest we begin here in the drawing room and conduct a thorough inspection until we find the jewellery. I suspect it will be found somewhere between the drawing room and where Tommy was eventually located. <laughs> Miss Bingley folded her arms across her chest. I have no intention of getting on my hands and knees to peek under sofas. You do what you want, Mr. Bennet. During the whole of the rampage, Elizabeth watched the combatants. Miss Bingley's purpose was undeniable. Her desire to separate herself from her roots was obvious. Mr. Bingley's speaking up to challenge his sister's behaviour was pleasing. He would make an able husband for Jane, should the two fall deeply in love. Her father's defence and reasoning were exactly what was needed to partially diffuse the situation. What surprised Elizabeth most were her mother and Mr. Darcy. One said far more in her defence than Elizabeth ever expected. The other kept silent. Glancing at her mother, Elizabeth was stunned to see a sly smile on the woman's face, as her gaze darted between Mr. Darcy and her second child. Rocking back and forth to soothe the babe, Mrs. Bennet mouthed, so only Elizabeth could see. Fine eyes! Eight. Late that evening, after the candles had been extinguished, the fires banked and the curtains pulled, Darcy reflected on the events of the day. Sipping his brandy, he pondered the differences and similarities between the Bingleys and the Bennets. It never ceased to amaze Darcy how disparate siblings could be. Charles Bingley was a gentle man, with a nature that leaned towards pleasing others more than himself. His sisters were vipers. When the party and staff had been unable to find Mrs. Hurst's bracelet, the tantrum the woman threw would have pleased a Drury Lane audience. For those at Netherfield Park, it was an embarrassment. He would think no more of them. Before the day prior, he would have judged Mrs. Bennet and her youngest two daughters to be identical in silliness and desirous of all the attention to be on themselves. Although he knew little about Miss Kitty and Miss Lydia, he could conclude without wavering that the mother while she had a few unattractive habits, was a woman of strong attachment to her family. Then there was Elizabeth. In the few occasions they had been in company before she arrived at Netherfield Park, he had noted her kindness to each of her family members. She never ridiculed her mother and always displayed respect for her father. Little Tommy favoured her above the others. Before they had turned in for the night, she had reported a vast improvement in her sister's health. Again, another example of her tenderness and compassion. She was devoted to her family. Was that what he wanted in a wife? Certainly. His own mother cherished him from the day he was born. He yearned to have a mate who would treat him and any children with which they were blessed in the exact same manner. His mother's presence at Pemberley had been like sunshine. He knew it would be the same with Elizabeth in his home, Nonetheless, the salient fact was that they had spent little time together. It was far too soon for him to offer for her. Was it too soon to ask for a courtship, where they could publicly get to know each other better? Would she accept him if he did? He sighed. In the end, that was the most important question, one without an answer. Hearing the click of a door, Darcy glanced at the clock. Both hands were on the twelve. It was past hours for visiting— None of the Bingleys had the habit of wandering the halls during the night. Thus it must be Elizabeth, with a need for her sister. Drawing his robe tight around him, and plunging his cold toes into his slippers, he quietly opened his own door to discover whether he was correct about the disturbance in the hallway. It was indeed Elizabeth. Good heavens! Her hair was down almost to her waist, shining with vibrant health in the light of the candlestick she held. She was glorious! He was unable to breathe, and might have had his mouth gaping open with drool gathering at the back of his throat. "'Mr. Darcy, do you mean to frighten me by coming in this state so late in the evening?' She quipped. "'Is Miss Bennet well? 
Is she needing something I can obtain for her care? Are you well? He spoke so quickly that even he was not able to keep up. He hated how his tongue twisted when his emotions were the master. She smiled. He relaxed. The fire in Jane's room is not able to keep up with the dropping temperature. I seek more blankets to keep her warm. And for yourself? She chuckled softly. Heavens no, I will snuggle under the bedclothes with her. We will be as warm as toast in no time. Pray, allow me. The mental picture he carried with him as he went below stairs was entirely inappropriate. Walking by the tall windows in the dining room, he pulled back a curtain to see a heavy mist falling in the moonlight. Snow in Hertfordshire in October was rare, but possible. His father told him that the year he was the same age as Tommy, the weather in all of England was severe. The Thames froze completely, snow remained as long as four months in the south of England, and sleep was recorded on the coast as early as August. The same happened the following year, with persistent cold from September to November, before the winter season officially began. Darcy was used to the freezing weather and heavy snow in Derbyshire, which seemed to be influenced by the Icelandic currents. What little air was seeping through the window pane in front of him was frigid. He suspected that there was a strong possibility they would wake to a world draped in white by morning. Would that he could be a mouse in the corner to see Tommy's reaction to the soft white fluff. He grinned to himself at the image. His hope was impossible. Or was it? Elizabeth had barely stirred from the bed when a maid delivered fresh coal for the fireplace, hot tea and a note from Mr Bingley. Jane, pray wake. Elizabeth gleefully tapped her sister on the shoulder. Mr Bingley has sent you a lover's note. What? Jane turned over immediately, wiping the sleep from her eyes and blushing. No, he would not have done so, would he? Waving the folded missive as bait to get her sister fully awake, Elizabeth pretended to vacate the bed. With no surprise, Jane grabbed a handful of her hair and demanded her to remain. Snatching the paper from Elizabeth, she tore it open and read it aloud. To the Mrs. Bennet, should you look out the window, you will see our world is white. I happen to have a sleigh in the stable that the butler has testified might be in good enough condition to transport a small party to Longbourn to witness Master Bennet's first glimpse of snow. If Miss Elizabeth is desirous of making the journey, and if your health allows, we would be delighted to have you join me and Darcy. We await your reply. With fondness crossed out, affection crossed out, kind regards, C.B. Jane squealed like her mother, covering her mouth with the blanket. Her eyes were huge, her cheeks were rosy, and her smile lit the day. What do you think? Of his poor penmanship in writing the closing? Elizabeth smiled. Fondness, affection. Well, I do believe our host was feeling more than he should when he wrote this, my dear sister. Elizabeth threw back the covers and looked out the window, amazed at the view. What do you think? Are you well enough to make the trip? I am. Jane scrambled from the bed. Unlike the day prior, she remained firmly on her feet. I would not miss seeing Tommy touch snow for the first time for the world. And you would not mind being in a sleigh with Mr Bingley either, I suspect. The pillow hit Elizabeth in the stomach. I'm sorry you will need to spend time with Mr Darcy. I know he has been a trial for you. Jane? Elizabeth paused. She had no idea how to put into words the difference in the man or rather, the difference in her outlook about the man. In my arrogance, I had vowed to hate Mr Darcy forever. I viewed him as the worst sort of man, since his vanity wounded my own. She looked through the window. I have been vain and nonsensical, full of my own importance, and prideful of my intellect and ability to sketch characters. I have been blinded by my own arrogance. Lizzie, what is this? Jane sat back on the bed, drawing her feet up underneath her. Oh, Jane! Elizabeth turned back to her. Since I arrived at Netherfield Park, he has been the consummate gentleman, one who is attentive, discerning and kind. Yet he is also the exact same man who called me tolerable, not handsome enough to dance with. I no longer know what to believe about him, or about myself. I fear I have been a fool. A fool in love? Jane whispered. 
I cannot know, Elizabeth admitted. When I assumed that he would have disdain for Mamma and Tommy, instead he shows them respect. When I thought he would not desire to spend time with Papa, he spent over an hour in such deep discussion that they overlooked our brother wandering off. Jane, his efforts to find our brother were... Oh, sister, he felt my pain in his own heart. How can I possibly continue to hate a man with qualities I admire? I believe you need time away to consider this, Lizzie, Jane suggested. Then she immediately added, But what do I know about love or affection? Elizabeth pondered her words briefly. What I do know is that we have two handsome men waiting for us downstairs. Should Mamma learn we were dilly-dallying, she would pinch us so hard we would not be able to sit for a week. Grinning, Jane said, Oh, you are absolutely correct. Then she ran to the dressing room. Peeking out into the hallway, the maid came and assisted them to pack and get dressed quickly. Before too many minutes had passed, both Bennets were covered in layers of their available clothing. As they descended the stairs to the waiting gentleman below, Elizabeth could not help but observe, "'If we fell the length of the stairs, sister dear, we have so much padding that we would bounce and be unharmed.' Their giggles caught the attention of Mr Bingley and Mr Darcy, a footman with a pile of blankets in his arms, stood waiting for them to exit the house. Through the open door was a carriage pulled by four horses. No sleigh was in sight. Ah, Bingley hesitated. We were unable to use the sleigh once it was hauled out from the stall. Both Darcy and the head groom determined it was far from safe. Darcy's carriage is heavy enough to break through any ice. His driver and team are used to pulling through heavy snow, so we will be conveyed to Longbourn in comfort. These two inches will be as nothing to them. I am happy with the choice, Jane replied directly to Mr Bingley, who blushed under her gaze. Miss Elizabeth, if you would allow me to escort you to our chariot, Mr Darcy bowed before offering his arm. The man really should not smile. It set the butterflies fluttering in Elizabeth's stomach. Resting her hand on his forearm, she was surprised when he clasped it with his other hand and tucked it around his elbow. The ground is slippery. We would not want you to fall. He grinned. No, we would not want that at all, Mr. Darcy. Nor would we want you to slip, since you will take me down with you. The lift of his brow and his mischievous expression swirled the butterflies into a whirling mass. I will not let you fall. Then let us be off, sir. He held her arm close, keeping her right beside him. The front steps had been covered with small pebbles to provide traction. The path to the carriage had been swept clean. A carpet was laid down. With the precautions taken, there was absolutely no chance she would have in any way injured herself in the inclement weather. The silly man knew it. Rather than slake her fears by telling her the arrangements that had already been put into place, he had teased her. Who was this man? Nine. The three-mile journey began with every comfort being addressed, warm blankets lined with fur skins, hot bricks for their feet, and deliciously soothing tea had been provided, along with a maid to serve them. Mr Bingley, who sat opposite Jane, started to speak several times, but ended up just gazing deeply into her eyes. Jane simply could not look away from him. Thus it was left to Elizabeth and Darcy to break the silence. Mr Darcy... I find it extremely satisfying listening to the carriage wheels crunch through the snow. To me, it is a sound unequal to anything else I have heard. I agree. Mr. Darcy again asked after her comfort, before continuing, Do you enjoy snow? I do, Elizabeth smiled. From my earliest memories, I can count on one hand the times we had enough snow here in Meryton to make it worth getting cold and wet to play. Jane had no interest in throwing snowballs, I made it my aim to pack the snow tightly and hit anything moving or standing still. When Kitty and Lydia were old enough to enjoy the winters, they would lay on the snow and sweep their arms and legs out to make what they termed lovely ladies in plain clothing. Only one time has there been enough snow to make a miniature snowman. Jane finally quit looking at Mr Bingley long enough to comment. One of my keenest recollections was when we were incredibly young the day after the snow fell, Lizzie jumped up early to enjoy another day playing. When she stepped outside, she cried inconsolably, 
because someone had come during the night and stolen all the snow, leaving behind dirty patches and puddles. Jane! Heat surged into Elizabeth's cheeks. I must have been a mere four or five years old at the time. A precious memory one would never want to forget. Mr. Darcy looked upon her with kindness, where she expected derision. Would she ever come to know this man? In that exact second in time, Darcy determined his course. He would offer a courtship. Perhaps sometime during the morning, he could have a private word with Mr. Bennet, to see if the man would welcome Darcy's attentions towards his second child. Then he would speak to Elizabeth. Until that point, he had feared the process of getting to know another with the expectation of marriage. The simple reason for his reticence was that, had he not met and come to admire Elizabeth, he would only have been in such an arrangement if forced by compromise. Under the current conditions, he was more than willing. His heart was completely settled with this decision. There was nothing more to do than to make himself agreeable to the daughter and her father. With that in mind, he offered a memory of his own. As mentioned, I grew up with snow at Pemberley. What I was unfamiliar with was the same weather conditions in London. He mused. And one of the earlier facts I remember about my father was his constantly telling me, each time we travelled from Pemberley to town, to be careful to stay away from the moving water of the Thames. He would outline the dangers to grown men, strong men, who worked on the docks, who got too close to the river to their everlasting detriment. He paused while the others nodded. The Thames claimed too many lives each year from those who somehow ended up in its depths. Imagine my chagrin. The winter the river froze solid. I believe I might have been the same age as your disappointment with the snow's disappearance, Miss Elizabeth. And both my father and mother were overjoyed at the prospect of attending a hastily assembled ice fair. I, on the other hand, was horrified. He smirked. They pleaded and prodded and promised all sorts of treats, should I relent. I simply would not. Oh, my! Elizabeth exclaimed. What a terrible position you were in. The very people you trusted to keep you safe were now seeming to throw you into danger. That, my lady, is exactly the way I saw matters. Darcy tipped his head. My father had to physically pick me up and carry me, sobbing, down the steps to the river bank. When he took the first step onto the ice, I screamed like my life was ending and pleaded with him to return us home immediately. In my childish mind, I could not match the man holding me with the one I knew who preached the need to tenderly care for a wife and child. Elizabeth sat forward on the squabs. How did he convince you that it was safe? He chuckled. In truth, he did not. I quieted with his reminder that as the future master of Pemberley, it was a disgrace for me to have a tantrum in public. Nonetheless, I spent the whole of the hour we were there in a terrified panic, expecting to fall through the ice and drown at any moment. Where they saw beauty and excitement, I saw danger. I was completely unswayed by the smell of hot apple cider filled with spices, the jugglers, the booksellers, and the men trying to impress their ladies by their antics on the ice. By the time the Thames froze again, I was old enough to judge its merits as worthy of my time by myself. Did you find it worthy, sir? she asked. Absolutely. I dragged my sister with me, kicking and screaming all the way. You would not, Elizabeth grinned. You are correct, I would not, Darcy smiled. We have a lake at Pemberley, where Georgiana and I enjoy ice skating with a warm fire, hot cider and fried bread after. The ice no longer scares either of us. Elizabeth sat back in her seat, her expression pensive. How he wished he knew what was going through her mind. Did she find him foolish or approachable after hearing his tale? He wanted to know. He needed to know. Perhaps, if she accepted a courtship, then he would eventually feel free to inquire about her thinking. Or better yet, he would know her well enough that he no longer needed to ask. Their arrival at Longbourn was expected, since Darcy had a note delivered shortly after daybreak to Mr. Bennet. Elizabeth and Jane were welcomed by the staff before Mr. Bennet appeared at the door. "'You are just in time!' He kissed Jane on the cheek and gave Elizabeth a quick embrace. Tommy loudly declared it was time to rise about ten minutes ago. By now the whole house is stirring. His nurse is readying him. He shall arrive hungry and ready for mischief.' Rocking back on his heels, Mr. Bennet looked directly at Darcy. 
I wonder whom he will be more pleased to see. You, Mr. Darcy, or Lizzie? Da! Izzy! Pop, pop! Ja! Nothing was said to Mr. Bingley, although he was the recipient of a grin. Well, now we know. Mr. Bennet slapped Darcy on the back as he removed his son from the nurse. Placing him on the floor, the child rushed at Darcy, grabbing him around the legs. Ump! Darcy was quick to obey. Good morning, young man. Did you sleep well? Ummy! Ah, you are a hungry little bear this morning. He tickled the boy under his chin, then listened to his light-hearted giggles, which sounded better than the most acclaimed piece of music available. Da, ummy! The lad pointed towards the dining room. They left their outer garments in the entrance with the staff to adjourn to a well-laden table. Since none of them had broken their fast at Netherfield Park, Mr. Bennet had prepared well. "'You must be surprised or stunned that we allow Tommy at the table, "'rather than having his nurse feed him upstairs.' "'He did not wait for a reply before continuing. "'One way I have discovered to know what is happening with each of my girls "'is to overhear their discussions when they are the most relaxed. "'Therefore, from infancy, we have had them join us to break our fast together.' "'It is a pleasing arrangement,' Darcy observed, "'determining right then to do the same once he had a family.' You will note that my son is unusually silent at the moment. He's not easily distracted from his food. Once satisfied, he appears to believe that the rest of the family and staff are here for his personal entertainment. He's quick to offer opinions, although most of us cannot understand a thing he says. Pop, pop! Tommy crammed another bite into his mouth. So? Yes, son, slowly. Eat slowly, like a gentleman. Mr. Bennet pulled the sausage from his little fingers. Do you see how Mr. Bingley and Mr. Darcy take one bite at a time and swallow before taking another? So, Tommy observed them both. So. It hit Darcy like a ton of bricks how much of his daily life would be affected by having a family. The adjustment would be tremendous. He would need to set the best example possible, be reliable and strong. More than that, he would need to learn how to bend, to be approachable. He was far from perfect. He was a man of many mistakes, but he would devote his life to being up to the challenge. Darcy laid his utensils down to address his host, a flutter in his stomach. Mr. Bennet, might I have a moment of your time while Tommy is readied for outside play? It would be sincerely appreciated. Mr. Bennet's brows rose. You do not believe you are a bit premature? I do not. Her father glanced at Elizabeth before giving his decision. Very well, then. Darcy's stomach calmed. Glancing at Elizabeth, he could not read her expression. Had she guessed his intentions? Was she pleased? As her brother had done at Netherfield Park, her eyes stayed on his, never wavering nor blinking. He searched the depths of her irises. Nothing. He surveyed each corner and her lashes. Nothing. He looked up at her brows, in time to see a slight lift on the right side. Ha! There it was. Mirroring her expression, the relief at seeing the beginnings of a smile released the remaining tension he had not known he was bearing. She knew. As anxious as he was to proceed, little Tommy had other things on his mind. Dow! Pay! You want to play? Elizabeth asked, before lifting her brother from his chair. Walking with him, she directed him to the windows in the dining room. Look, snow. No. The boy looked up at her, his brows furrowed. She shook her head, grinning. Not no, Tommy, snow. It is the best place to play in the whole world. Pay! The boy hurried from the room, only to quickly return. In his hands was one small boot. Pay! The rest of the room's occupants were mobilised. Any interview with Mr Bennet would be postponed for the few minutes Tommy was allowed in the cold. To his surprise, rather than walk or run, Tommy wanted Darcy to carry him outside. Elizabeth pulled on her gloves, then clasped the inside of his elbow. We would not want you to fall now, would we? Darcy's heart was full to brimming with stirred emotions. 
Tommy bent down and kissed his sister on the cheek. Then he turned and did the same to Darcy. Leaning towards his sister, the lad held his arms out to her. Darcy did not know whether he was more disappointed to lose the privilege of holding the boy or his sister's hand on his arm. Tommy grinned up at Darcy. Iss! Pleased to continue playing this particular game, Darcy bent down, his lips puckered in time to hear Mrs. Bennet's voice announcing her approach from above. Tommy leaned forward enough to see his mother, so that Darcy completely missed his cheek, and kissed Elizabeth's instead. 10. Mayhem ensued. Elizabeth gasped. Mrs. Bennet rushed down the stairs. It might have been Bingley who giggled. Jane slapped her hand over her opened mouth. Mr. Bennet was the only one in the entrance hall who remained calm. Mr. Bennet! Mr. Bennet! Did you see what he has done? Elizabeth's mother gasped, then continued. He has kissed her! Mr. Darcy has kissed our Lizzie! Yes, Mrs. Bennet. Whilst that may not have been his intention, he has indeed kissed our daughter. Well? Mrs. Bennet demanded, her fists planted on her hips. Well, my dear, I believe it is time to take our son outside for his first experience with the snow. Mr. Darcy and I will speak later. Plucking Tommy from Elizabeth's arms, he walked through the open door like nothing monumental had happened. Mrs. Bennet fluttered her hands, then looked to Darcy. What could he say in defence of himself? He knew he could fall upon her mercy, which would require Elizabeth to marry him within the month. It was not his desire to obtain her as his bride by force, nor could he imagine it would be hers. One thing he had learned from observing both Elizabeth and her brother was that neither appreciated being told what to do. Without a word, he offered Elizabeth his arm. Gratefully, without hesitation, she took it. Leaving a sputtering Mrs. Bennet behind, they exited in time to hear Tommy's first delighted laugh. He had kissed her. Mr. Darcy had actually kissed her in front of her family and Longbourn's staff. Oh, Elizabeth knew his intent was to return Tommy's kiss, but, oh my word, he had kissed her. When he had earlier asked her father for a private conversation, at first Elizabeth had no clue what had inspired the request. It was not until she looked Mr. Darcy directly in the eye across the table that she knew in her heart what was coming. How did she feel about his speaking to her father? She did not love him, did she? Certainly not. Or did she? How was she to respond if he did ask for a courtship? Or had his display sealed their future, with marriage being the only option? She knew what her mother would demand. What was unknown was her father's response. Glancing up at the man beside her, she saw the storm in his own eyes. What were they to do? Looking outside, Elizabeth knew exactly what needed to be done. Accepting his arm, they walked out of the house. On the front steps, the sight that greeted them was pure joy. Tommy was attempting to catch the sparsely falling flakes in his mouth. His little tongue was poked out, and his eyes were closed. Pop, pop, mo! the little boy insisted. Finally, her father bent and gathered a handful to present to his son. Tommy's gloved fingers gently touched the flakes, his mouth gaping open, his eyes as big as they had ever been. Ooh, cold! Mr. Bennet chuckled. Yes, my son, the snow is cold. Do you want down? Dow! Tommy started wriggling. As soon as his boots hit the ground, he bent and started sweeping his hands from side to side, spreading the snow into small piles. He repeated, Caw! each time his hands came together. Before anyone could stop him, he put the palm of his glove to his mouth and licked. Caw, 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 he muttered, then flung his hands in the air, sending snowflakes in a flurry around him. Oh, pity! Mr. Bennet, that is enough play. It is terribly cold. I fear Thomas will become ill. Pray bring him inside. Her desperate mother stood in the open doorway with a spare quilted blanket, ready to receive her son. Elizabeth could not begin to know the worries a mother had over her children. When Tommy put his hands up for Mr. Darcy to lift him and transport him to the house, 
Elizabeth's mind jumped to the future. Him doing the same with dark-haired babies with brown eyes and wavy black hair. What? Where had that image come from? After delivering the lad safely to her mother, Darcy rejoined her. Mr Bingley and Jane had turned to stall the garden when Mamma reminded Jane how recently she had been ill. Thus they turned for the house instead, leaving Darcy and Elizabeth standing alone within full view of anyone looking out the front windows. Elizabeth glanced up and spied her mother peeking out. Mr Darcy, I am not one to back away from a situation and I discern you are the same. Therefore we need to logically discuss what happened. Logically? Do you mean when I kissed you? Accidentally? Elizabeth was quick to remind him. Her heart started racing as fast as it had when his lips touched her cheek. Despite the cold, she felt warmth creeping up her neck. He rubbed his hand over his jaw. I see why you have reached that conclusion, Elizabeth, although you would be far from correct. In her confusion at his exact meaning, she teased. Sir, there you go again, being ungentlemanly enough to point out my flaws in public, as well as calling me by my given name without permission. He looked around the yard, seeing no one except a groom in the distant stables, and Jane where she had joined her mother at the window. You are right to point out my error, for I acted the oaf in your presence when we first met. It has been a long while since I decided never to do so again. When you claimed I was merely tolerable. At his pained expression, she offered him relief. Mr Darcy, I am in jest. You have apologised already. I accepted your regret as genuine. Miss Elizabeth Bennet, then know this. I have arranged to speak with your father to offer you a courtship for the purpose of coming to know each other well enough to determine if we have enough affection to marry. I have not always considered others' needs and desires when I have made weighty decisions such as this, and I am heartily sorry. I vow to you to become a better man, one whom you deserve and desire. Therefore I ask you now, would you do me the honour of accepting my offer of a courtship? Elizabeth could not miss the tension in his body and the seriousness of his expression. Without hesitation, she replied with candour, I would like to get to know you better. He smiled and clasped her hand in his. When did you change your thinking? For I am in no doubt you once did not like me at all. Was it when I kissed you? Accidentally, she teased. He must have taken that as a personal challenge, for he gently drew her closer and wrapped one arm around her, while his hand tenderly caressed her cheek. Running his thumb across her jaw, he bent down, his eyes still locked on hers, until they flickered closed. His lips were delicious. His kiss thrilled her as lightning shot from her mouth to the tips of her toes. Her fingers, where they gripped his lapels, tingled and burned. Her breathing stopped, along with her heart. Never had she understood the power of an embrace with someone who was... loved... As he kissed her once, twice and then again, her mind cleared so that finally it was in harmony with her heart. She was head over heels, deeply in love with Fitzwilliam Darcy. Her mother's voice could be heard clearly. Oh, Mr Bennet, I knew how it would be. A single man with a fortune had to be in want of a wife. Who better than one of our daughters? We shall have a wedding at Longbourn at last. Darcy chuckled against her lips. Kissing her a last time, he said, I thank you for agreeing to a courtship, my dear. I thank you for understanding that I am an imperfect man who will devote his life to you, should you allow. Mostly I thank you for returning my embrace with a zeal to match my own. Looking around where they stood, he located the hat she must have somehow brushed from his head. When had she done that? Shall I escort you inside so I may speak with your father? Bowing at the waist, he offered her his arm. Certainly, for we would not want any mischief or mayhem to come from slipping on the ice, would we? Elizabeth gazed at the man who would become her husband. Yes, they would have a courtship, but after those kisses, their future was sealed. She was surprised when Mr Darcy stopped before entering the house. Elizabeth... You should know that I am not a patient man. My preference is for a short courtship, a short engagement, and a long marriage. 
studying him with eyes that now saw him clearly, she said, I find I am courting an intelligent man. He grinned down at her, kissing her smile. Sweeping his arm out in front of himself, he waited while she entered the doorway in front of him. Then let us begin. Epilogue Elizabeth's days were kept busy by a mother planning a wedding despite no proposal yet having been offered, a father who teased her about her mother, and a gentleman who adored her. Gratefully, Mrs. Hurst's bracelet had been located in her own room, where she had apparently dropped it on a garnet-encrusted ceramic dog sitting at attention. When she and her disappointed younger sister heard of Mr. Darcy's courtship, they left for London without any hint of when they might return. Darcy said he was pleased to have them gone from Netherfield Park. Elizabeth was happy he had one less distraction. Between her mother and Tommy, he was rarely left alone, so the opportunities for privacy with Elizabeth were minimal. On this day, exactly two weeks since the snowfall, Tommy was missing. Mamma, as she had done at Netherfield Park, fainted. Papa sent Kitty and Lydia for her salts, while Mary continued playing gloomy music on the pianoforte. Jane and Bingley could not be interrupted from gazing at one another, so it was left to Darcy and Elizabeth to locate the boy. Departing the drawing-room after a cursory search, Darcy asked, "'Where do we look first? Elizabeth pulled him in the direction of her father's study. Sure enough, Tommy was curled up in the cat's bed with a picture-book laying open where it had fallen from his hands. He was peaceful in his slumber. When Darcy knelt to gather the boy in his arms, he heard the click of the door closing behind them. Standing, he turned to see Elizabeth leaning back against the wooden surface, a gleam in her eye, and a smile upon her lovely face. "'What are we to do now that we are alone, sir?' she teased. "'Oh, I think we can figure out something.' He approached her stealthily. Drawing her into his arms, he mused, "'Here I thought when I entered the room that the only Bennet I would hold would be your brother. Foolishness, really.' He kissed her with reverence, then ardour, stirring her desire into an inferno. Elizabeth felt a tug on her skirt. Easy! Ump! She was surprised how quickly passion deflated into frustration. Resting her head back against the door, she shook her head, then opened her eyes. Fitzwilliam Darcy was a wonder. How had she ever thought him aloof, vain and prideful? He had jumped back as soon as Tommy spoke, knelt on his knee, and gathered the child into his arms. Her eyes rolled when, from outside the study, quick footsteps approached. Rapid tapping and her mother's voice demanding to be allowed in caused Elizabeth to laugh. What else was to be done? As she reached to open the door, Darcy stopped her. With Tommy resting his head on Darcy's shoulder, he said, First, your brother causes mischief. Once we let your mother in, there will be nothing but mayhem. Marry me, Elizabeth, so we can enjoy the same for the rest of our lives. How could she possibly refuse? She could not. The end. This has been Mischief and Mayhem, a Pride and Prejudice novella. Written by Christy Capps. Narrated by Stevie Zimmerman. Copyright 2020 by Joy D. King. Production copyright by Quiet Mountain Press, LLC.